All right, so today we're going to continue talking about file systems. And welcome to Friday. Uh, so um, in particular, we'll talk about uh, some other, you know, we'll keep looking at, at doing some file system introspection using uh, common, or maybe not so common, but Linux utilities that you can use yourselves. And then uh, we'll talk about finding data blocks. So we'll talk a little bit today about path name resolution, but we'll also talk about ways of, once I find a file, finding the data blocks that are associated with that file, right? And of course, this is something that's made somewhat challenging by the fact that I want to let files grow and shrink to take on different sizes, right? All right, um, no announcements today. Anybody have any questions about course administrivia or any other things before we go on? OK, good. Um, any questions about inodes? So at the end of last class, we started talking about index nodes or inodes, which are uh, special structures that are stored on the disk and are used to store information about files and file contents. So anybody have any questions about these before we do just a little bit of review? All right, so we, we started looking specifically at ext4, right? I want to look at a specific file system to kind of put this stuff uh, into context. Um, ext4 creates a single inode per file. Uh, we talked about the fact that these were 256 bytes. So uh, if I'm talking about 512 byte sectors, I can get two in a sector, 4K blocks, I can get 16 in a block. What is in the inode structure? What does the inode contain? Jeremy. Okay, okay, yeah, so inodes are, are really all metadata, right? So we talked a little bit about how if you looked down at the disk itself, right, there are you know, two types of thing that are stored on the disk in a very broad categorization. One type is file data, right? And the other type is sort of file system metadata, right? So things that are not data blocks, data that's on disk that's not part of any particular file but is used by the file system to find files, to organize information about files, to et cetera, et cetera, right? So inodes are, inodes are in that second category. They are not file data. They are used to store information about the file system that the file system needs to operate. But what specifically is in an inode? Navia. Yeah, so I might have some information about you know, users and, and permissions, right? Something about the, the uh, people who can open this file or read and write to it, right? Or some, some permission information. Simon. OK, so file name is interesting, right? We'll talk a little bit about that today. There's actually not necessarily a final name, but the second part of your answer is correct, right? So certainly, once I find an inode, what I want to be able to do is find the data associated with that file, right? This is not the file data, right? But there, is, there are data blocks on disk somewhere that are associated with this file. So once I locate the inode, it would be nice if I could find, find that file data. What else is stored in here? Dan. Yeah, so we, there was a variety of different timestamps that, that ext4 stored, right? When it was created, last modified, even a deleted time, right? Um, so right, so Simon got the location of the file data blocks. That's important. Permissions, uh, Navia got, and then timestamps, right? So, um, and so let's go back to naming, right? So remember, inodes are numbered, right? Inodes are where the file system understands numbers, right? So the inodes are all indexed by number. The inode itself has really no concept of a name, right? The name that you use to tell the file system about an inode is the inode number, right? The path name and how it's resolved to an inode number is something that we'll talk about today, right? Um, yeah, so here we go. What, so how, how do, I don't know if we actually went over this yet. Uh, oh, okay, right? So we asked, you know, if I have an inode number, how do I find that inode on disk, right? So path resolution is going to take me from a path Right, a series of characters to an inode number. Once I have the inode number, how do I find that on disk? And what ext4 does is it just stores those inodes in well-known locations. Right, so you can imagine one big array of inodes at the beginning of the disk. That's not exactly how it works. They're actually spread throughout the disk. But anyway, it's a fairly simple mapping from inode number to where the inode is on disk. Right. Um, and we talked about the fact that inodes may not be located near file contents in this model, right? And to reduce the seek times between inodes and the contents associated with the file, uh, ext4 creates multiple blocks of inodes throughout the disk, right? So that they, so it tries to put file contents. And then when ext4 allocates 
file contents, it tries to do so close to the inode that, that stores the file metadata, right? Why would I, why would you expect to see lots of seeks back and forth between inodes and the associated, uh, associated data blocks? AJ. Yeah, I mean, we talked about an example of a, of a write operation, right? And, and how many different parts of the disk that write operation was going to modify. You, usually, any sort of file system operation involves reading or writing or modifying or changing both data blocks that store file contents and the inode, right? If I want to grow the file, I have to you know, make sure that the inode knows how to find the new data blocks, and then I actually have to allocate the new data blocks and write data into them, right? So frequently, any change to a file is going to involve involve modifying or reading both of these structures, right? Then it turns out that inodes are also good candidates for file system caching, right, which we'll talk about on Monday. Um, and, and with DXT4, the other thing is when you format the system, you create a fixed number of inodes, and if you run out of those inodes, you can't create any more files even if you have, even if you have more data blocks on the system. And so, you know, file systems try to make assumptions about file sizes so that they can allocate, allocate the right amount of metadata. Just in case this isn't obvious, I mean, this is what happens when you format a disk, right? So you may have wondered, why do I need to format a drive, right? And why, in some cases, does it take so long? I don't know why it takes so long, right? But when you format the drive, what's happening is that the file system is taking the data blocks that you've given it, and it's, you know, adding any metadata to the disk that it needs, right? So ext4, when you format it, is going to allocate all of these, um, allocate all of these inode structures, and then potentially initialize some other parts of the disk, storing metadata that it needs to operate. Yeah, okay. Are the well-known locations that the inodes can go into specify like some file, like the L file? Uh, yeah, so, so the question is where are, like, okay, how do I find the blocks of inodes? I think they're stored in what's called the super block, right? Which is another on disk data structure, and we'll actually look at the super block in more detail today, right? So a lot of times file systems will write, you know, a certain amount of data about the entire file system into a, into a, into a structure that we call the super block, right? So it's the, it's a block containing a bunch of other metadata about the system, right? And one of the things that was pr is probably in the ext4 superblock is the location of these inode arrays, right? Yeah, Sean. Wouldn't there be any sense of stopping uh, like some sort of object which uh, creates more inodes or creates more space? Inodes if uh, the system runs out of inodes or creates inodes if the system runs out of inodes or creates Yeah, so it's a, good, it's a great question, right? So um, in, in general, you know, in the past, uh, file systems haven't necessarily been great about doing these sort of online operations, but if anybody has used some, some more modern file systems, they've actually gotten much better at this, right? So uh, ext4, I know for a fact, because I've done this recently, can actually uh, resize itself dynamically while the system is running, right? So if you, you, you may say, it's, of course, as you imagine, it's easier to expand the file system than it is to contract it, right? Because there might be some data that you have to move around. But in an online fashion, ext4 can actually expand itself dynamically, right? which, is pretty, which is pretty wild, right? Like when I was a young whippersnapper, file systems didn't do that, right? Like, like you formatted them, and they had a certain amount of space. And if you bought, a, if you bought an extra drive, there was kind of like, well, you had, to part, you had to set it up as a separate partition. It was a huge pain, right? But now there's all these magical tools, so you can kind of add it to that, and then suddenly you have more space, right? Which is, you know, again, I mean, something that still impresses me, but I still use Firefox, right? So obviously you guys know how, that I'm an old, crufty person in general. Um, all right, so any other questions about inode? That's, that's a good question. So yeah, I, I don't know about, I mean, you could certainly allocate more space on the disk. I don't know if you could actually find a way to allocate more inodes, right? You, you might be able to, right? Any other questions about inodes before we? we go on. So I have a f we have a few more. Um, so bef before we go too much farther, right, so, so d we talked a little bit about directories, right, and, and I've hinted several times that directories are, are just files, right, and, and that's actually the case, right, so every directory has its own inode number, it's a file. The contents of that directory are, are file system specific, and essentially what directories hold is a data structure that maps inode numbers to relative names. Right? So this is now kind of important. So the because the directory has its own name, right? And then inside the directory, there are, you can think of it almost like an array, right? I mean, I don't know exactly what the data structure looks like, but there's some sort of data structure that essentially maps, you know, relative path names to inode numbers. Um, so for example, even, it, this is kind of fun, right? So even your good old trusty friend LS, right, 
uh, can display this information. So for example, uh, ls-i will actually tell ls to display the i known numbers associated with the contents of the directory that you ask it to display, right? So for example, here I've asked it to uh, give me the i known number for the root directory, right? Remember that uh, on ext4, for whatever reason, by convention, the inode for the root directory is 2, okay? Um, now what I've done in the second command is asked it to give me a list all the inode numbers for the contents of the root directory. Right? So now this is going to read the contents of the root directory and tell me all the inode numbers. And, and these are the inode numbers for things that are in the root directory. Right? So these are other directories. Right? You see they have inode numbers just like files. Right? In fact, from this output, you really can't distinguish between files and directories. Right? Some of these things are files, like uh, VM Linux is a file, or VM Linux is a file, and, and some of these things are directories. Yeah, Jeremy. Oh, yeah. So, OK, so this is a great question. Right? Why do proc and, and sys have the same inode number? Right? Remember, this is an ext4 file system rooted in root. What have we said before about proc and sys? Are proc and sys real file systems? No. So, so proc and sys here are actually not real files. Right? I don't know why the number 1 is used. That's a good question. Right? Um, but the reason why these have the same number, and I think that one is probably like a, a special number here, which basically says that that's actually not a real, that's not a real file, right? If you looked at mount, what you'd find is that sys is mounted on root, right? So sys is actually its own separate file system, right? So the ext4 file system that we're displaying information about doesn't actually include sys or proc. I wonder if there's another, no, there's not really another one here that's, that's a separate, that's a great question. Any other questions about this? Dev is also, I think, another, another special case, potentially, but I'm not sure about that. Right, so, so now um, what I can do right, is I can say, OK, well, well show me the, the contents of a different directory. Right? So here's my home directory. My home directory on this machine has I know number you know, 393,219. I don't know why, but that's what it is. Um, and if I, now I can display the contents of it. And the contents are a single. Yeah, I'm trying to remember which one is which here. Right? It, there, oh, sorry, there's two directories, right? So there's an Ubuntu directory and there's my home directory, and these are the inode numbers for those directories, right? So what you can see is, again, the directory contents are mapping these relative path names, right? So this is not, the, the directory does not map home Ubuntu, it, man, it maps Ubuntu, right? But because I'm inside the home directory, this is, so you guys probably have some sense now of how we're going to do path resolution. Right? Um, I think we already, yeah, I think we did this, right? So this is just, just a, oh, okay, well, this is a different, yeah, this is a directory, right? So we, we looked at this last time. This shows some information about the directory, right? Um, okay, let's, let, let me show you some other cool stuff, right? So this is a, um, this is a different command. Now what I'm asking here is, is, I said before, there's this special structure on disk that's called the super block, right? The super block is, a, is part of the file system data structure that contains all sorts of other information about the file. Right? And you can see this command gives you some sense of what's inside the ext4 superblock. And there's actually several pages worth of, worth of data in there. Right? So this is a pretty, pretty interesting, important data structure. Um, let me ask a, a different question. So uh, this superblock, right? so for example, uh, somebody had asked, how do I find the uh, groups of, of inodes? Well, here they are. Right? And in fact, if, you, if this goes on for several, many, many more group numbers, I think there were like 64 different uh, inode groups. Right? And this will tell me. Um, for this particular group on disk, um, here is the inode table, right? So this is where the inode table is stored. There's an inode bitmap. What do you think the inode bitmap is for? People who are thinking about assignment three may be thinking about bitmaps. And what can I do with the bitmap pretty efficiently? Any guesses? The inode bitmap is used to allocate inodes. So when I want to find a free inode, right, I look in the inode bitmap, and I look for a bit that's not set. Right? So the inode bitmap is going to reflect which inodes are in use and which inodes are not. Right? Uh, based on that, what about this? What does the block bitmap do? Jen. Yeah, so this is, this is for doing block allocations. Right? So if I want a new data block in this particular group, this is the block bitmap that I'm going to use, right? 
And then it tells me uh, a bunch of other things here. So this is kind of an interesting case, right? You'll see that there are zero free nodes, inodes, in this group, right? This group has run out of inodes, right? So as the system started to allocate inodes, apparently it, it allocated a bunch from this group, and this, this group is actually, um, actually has no free inodes and no unused inodes. So all the inodes in this group are, are in use, right? Uh, however, it has a bunch of free blocks, right? In fact, there's quite a bit of data block. There's quite a few data blocks left in this group, right? So this is kind of interesting. This is an ex example, right, of a group that maybe has a bunch of very small files in it, right? So it ran out of inodes before it ran out of data blocks. The next group is is a little bit more, a little bit different, right? So this one is also full, right? We have zero free inodes, but it has much fewer free blocks, right? So this one looks like the the file size was a better match for what ext4 was expecting. Right. And I actually don't know if ext4 will, will allocate uh, blocks between groups. Right. So it's possible that these free blocks here are just gone. Right. They're just, like, they're, they will never be able to be used because this group, this little piece of the disk is out of inodes. And so I, I might not be able to actually ever get these data blocks into a file. <laughs> um, all right, let's go back here. Right. So this is other information about the super block. It shows me uh, where it's mounted. Right, so this file system is mounted on root. This was the root file system for this machine. Um, it has a magic number here. What do you think that magic number is for? Uh, Amen. Yeah, it, well, it identifies the file system, right? So you know, it, it, this this identifies this as an ext4 file system. If you try to mount, if you tell, if you tell your system mount this, you know, device as a ext3 file system. Uh, it will check this magic number and say that that's like that's wrong, right? Like that, whatever is in that part of the disk, I don't know anything about it, right? That's not me. And, and if you ask me to try to do something with that stuff, I'll probably make lots of mistakes, right? So this this is some way to distinguish uh, different file systems from each other. Um, so this gives me the total number of inodes and blocks that were allocated. This gives me the free blocks and free inodes. So this is a relatively un, you know you know slightly used system about. 75% of my blocks are free, and about looks like even more than that in terms of inodes. Um, gives me my block size, blocks per group, right? So we looked at those groups before. So this tells me how many blocks are in each group. And if I can do this math in my head, it looks like I have about 128 megabytes per group right, on the disk, right? 32K blocks, 4K block size. Um, this tells me the inodes that were allocated per group, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's some information about when the file system was created, how many times it's been mounted, et cetera, et cetera. So, oh, this is kind of a fun thing, the lifetime writes, right? So the system tracks. Every time you do a write, this is the total amount of data that's ever been written to this, to this particular file system. It's kind of cool. Um, first inode. I don't know if this is the first inode that's available, and then the inode size. So, so it's a bunch of interesting information in here. And, and this is potentially quite important information for the system to have. So you know, we talked before about you know, disks and disks failing, and disks having sectors that go bad, and other sorts of problems. So how, what, what do you think the file system does to try to uh, make sure that all this data in the super block is stored safely? First of all, how, does, how do you think the, the file system finds the super block in the first place? Sarah. Tim? Yeah, it just puts it in a known place, right? It might be in like the first block of the disk or something, right? right? So, th so that, that works nicely. But what happens, like, what happens if this super block gets corrupted, right? Let's say that some of the data in here gets damaged by, I don't know, like a, a cosmic ray from outer space or something, right? Uh, you know, flips a bit in here. And, and, and so, so what could happen? So, th so this data could potentially get corrupted. And at that point, what would the, uh, this, could, this could potentially cause the file system to be unusable. So what would the file system, what do you think file systems do about this? Tim. Yeah, so yeah, it's a pretty simple approach to, you know, to, to, to trying to keep data up to date, make a bunch of copies of it, right? So there are probably multiple copies of this information that the file system has stored at multiple known locations within the disk, right? So if the, you know, the super block is corrupted, it can go try to get another copy of it and see if it can use that copy to repair the disk. Yeah, Jeremy. 
Good question. Yeah, I mean, there, that's, 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 that probably is true, right? So there probably is some sort of checksum or other way that it has a validated. And it might actually compare to superbox from different parts of the disk. Right, so you could do some sort of voting, but anyway, so very simple approach to you know to, to failure or survival, which is make multiple copies of something and hope that there's one out there that that's right. Okay. All right, so so now let's go back to this idea of path name translation, right? So we have a name, right? You've you've said open this particular file, right? Um, and the file system has to translate the path that you passed in. Into, into what? I mean, it has to find an I know number, right? Like, that's, that's, how the, that's what the disk knows about. The disk, at some level, says, give me an I know number, and I'll give you some information, right? So how do I bootstrap this process? I have a name, right? And what I need to get out of it is an I know number. So what's the first, what's the first thing I need to do? Andrew. Yeah, I need to start somewhere, right? I have to bootstrap this process somehow. Right now, I have no, I have no, I know numbers, right? So I need to start somewhere, right? And essentially, I start here, right, with the, with the, you know, the topmost portion of this, right? And, uh, and I need the I know number for root. So, what's the I know number for root, though? I'm kind of stuck, right? I don't, I don't know what that is. Jen, what's the I know number for root? Two. Two, right? Yeah, we just know what it is. Right, so the file system, I actually think maybe it's, it might be even in the super block, right? So the file system will know this is the root I know, right? And by convention, I think I need to see for it's two, right? So we start with two. This is a agreed on number, right? Okay, now what do I do? What do I do? Directories contain information about how to map relative paths to I know numbers. So what's the next step here? Mukta. Yeah, so I'm going to open the root directory, right, which is I'm going to tell the file system, give me the contents of the file with I know number two, right? These are directed. This is just a file, right? Directories are just files, right? And I'm going to open that up, and there's going to be a data structure in there that's going to map, you know, these, these strings, right, to other I know numbers, right? And I'm going to use that to map ETC to what its I know number is, right? And let's say it's, you know, whatever this was. I actually think I took this from the real example. So 393,218. Okay, what do I do next? Sirac. Open the directory Yeah, which directory? Yeah, remember, file system doesn't understand ETC, right? You say ETC is what? You know, okay. give me a number, right? So you tell the file system, I'd like the contents of I know the file with I know number 390,218, and I look in there for default, right? So I find default, and let's say it's at I know number 393,247. Jan, what do I do now? Yeah, so I open this and I look for keyboard, right? So you guys see how this works. It's not, 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 super, not super tough. And then uh, at, some, at some point, right, what I'm going to find along the way is a file, potentially. Right? Uh, let's say the keyboard hopefully was a file. So at some point, I'm going to get a file that is not a special file, directory file, that is actually a file. And then I have what I want. Right? So this is, you know, in a nutshell, how path translation is done. What happens if I? Um, Let's say, so here I've, I've asked, so there's a couple of things. So first of all, how many people have noted the fact that on your OS161 kernel, open destroys the path name that's passed in? How many people have noticed this? Possibly because it frustrated you for a period of time, because you were doing something that looked obvious that didn't work, right? So this is one of the reasons why open destroys that path name, right? Because open is taking the path name and it's, it's carving it up into little pieces and, and doing these operations on it separately. Right, so that's just, just kind of an interesting nit. Um, second thing is, what happens if I do an open from a relative path name? Right, so let's say rather than root etc, I was opening, you know, just etc. Right, something that's relative to, to where I am. How how does how does that differ from this process? It's quite similar, right? How does it how does it differ? So let's say I'm in home your username, and I open, I try to open this file, right? What do I, what do I start with? Bethany. It's very similar, 
The only difference is how I get going. Assume it. Uh, get the I node number for the directory I'm in? Yeah, so I need the I node number for the directory I'm in, right? Well, how, how do I have that? I have to have it, right? Because otherwise, how did I get in there in the first place, right? At some point, if you run commands you know, that, that operate on path names, I have, I have to have ha translated that path name at some point, right? The other thing is, I, usually there's a, there's a variable in my environment that says, here's the, the path name where you know, uh, my current working directory is, and I could, I could uh, prepend that to the path, right? So that's another approach, right? I could, just, I could construct a full, a full path name for it. Varun, well. did you have a question? Okay. All right. Okay, so now, now we've done this. Does anyone have any questions about path name translation, right? This is not super, this is, you know, now that we've figured out how to organize things on disk, this is not too bad. What, you know, what's the, what's the potential overhead of doing this, you know, on, on the disk itself? What could, what could potentially be a, be a problem here about, about doing this, especially if I'm doing it repeatedly, right? Remember, you know, users and, and, and processes know about these file names. So one of the things the file system is doing often is translating names to, to, to I know numbers, right? What's the potential problem here? Alyssa. What did I have to do at each step here? Yeah, so if, especially if these I know numbers are sprinkled all over the disk, right? If I actually have to go to disk to grab each one of these I nodes and, um, and you know, open the contents, then you know, I'm, I'm going to watch the little disk head you know, jump all over the disk, right? So this is potentially a, a performance issue. And again, we come back to caching, we'll talk about the fact that, that I nodes are a, are, are a real usual target for file system caching because they're very heavily used, right? Especially in path name route translation. And directory contents can be cached as well, right? So again, directories are files. If there's directories that I'm using often to translate path names, or really for any reason, the file system may start to cache them in memory to improve the, improve the lookup time. Right? And of course, there are consequences to doing that, right? Namely, that if I change their contents in memory and don't end up getting a chance to write those contents to disk before you pull the power cord out of the machine, then the file system might be in a, might be in a kind of weird state when I boot it up. And we'll talk about how to address that on Monday. Right? All right. So now, you know, so, so now at some point, you know, I've, I've done my path name translation. But when I start to use files, right, what I really want is data from the file. Right? So we've talked about how to find an inode. Right? But in, in many file systems, in some file systems actually, um, including one that, that, that we'll probably talk about in lecture next week, they, they've done this optimization where they actually, can, they actually will store a small amount of data in the inode itself. Right? So remember we said that there's a lot of files that are pretty small. Right? Um, in that case, there are some file systems that will optimize for this by actually taking the inode and having the inode be big enough that they can have some metadata in there, but they can also jam some data in there if they need to. Right? So for small files, the file might actually live, the contents might live in the inode. Right? So finding the inode might be enough to find the contents. On ext4, that's clearly not true. Right? I mean, the inodes are 256 bytes. Right? So not, not a lot's going to fit in there. And I think probably all of that data is used for file system metadata. Right? If you start ending up, you know, you have four byte timestamps, and then you have this and that, and some other data structures in there. I'm pretty sure that they, they don't do that. Right? But there have been some historical file systems that have done this. But in general, right, once we find an inode, we're not done. Right? We need to find the contents of the file. And so now the question is, how do we translate an offset within a file into the data blocks on disk? Right? So I found my inode. I'm in great shape. Right? But now the process says, you know, I want to read from, you know, offset 345, or if I'm reading a directory, I might say from offset 0. I want to read the contents of the file, so how do I find these data blocks, right? And, there, and this is another sort of data structure design question, right, that, that, that we, can, we can pose and talk about. So one way to do this is to just organize these data blocks in, into a linked list, right? So the inode contains so this is nice because the inode only has to contain a pointer to the first data block. And then each data block has to have some metadata that allows me to find the next data block. Right? So each data block 
You know, the format of the data box is up to the file system. So in this case, the data block has some format where it has a little bit of a header that has a pointer to the next data block, and the rest of it is data, right? And I can use those pointers in the data box to uh, follow this uh, string of data uh, blocks. I said data blocks like eight times in the past 30 seconds. Um, they follow these data blocks so I can find all the data I want, right, in the data blocks. Uh, so, so this is one way of doing it, right? And what's nice about the this approach. Right? Come back to simple data structure design questions. Frank. Um, is it easy to traverse? Yeah, I mean, the you know, data structure is kind of straightforward, like it's a linked list. What else is nice about it? Dan. <laughs> yeah, so there's no limit on the size of the file. That's one thing that I really wanted. Um, what, what, else is, what else is good? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a small amount of information in each data block, and there's also a small amount of information in the inode, right? All the inode has to contain is the pointer to the next data block, right? So that's nice. It's also simple, linked list. Small amount of information in each node. What's problematic about this, Jen? It's slow to do what? Yeah, because if I, if, let's say I'm trying to look up a, a portion of the file, right? I've asked for 512 bytes that are three megabytes deep in the file, right? You know, this might be an MP3 that I'm playing, right? So I'm asking for the next chunk of the file. I have to start from the inode, right? And he potentially, right? I could cache some information about where I am, whatever. But you know, the point is that in, in, in general, to look up an arbitrary block in the file, I have to start from the front and walk the file all the way till I get to the point where I want, right? And as files get bigger, this becomes more and more inefficient. Right. Um, so offset lookups are O n, right, in the in the size of the file. Right. All right. So let's talk about a. This is starting to feel like VM data structures all over again. Right. So um, another way I can do this is I can have a flat array. Right. So I have pointers to all the data blocks in the inode in a single array. It's allocated when I create the file. Right. <laughs> and now, in order to get to any data block, I just convert the offset to an index within this data structure and use that to find a pointer to the data block or the, you know, the, the offset of the data block, right? So what's nice about this? Yeah, sir. It's going to be more you want Yeah, I mean, what's the, what's the lookup time? Oh, one. Oh, one, right? It's constant time lookups. That's nice. Uh, it's also simple, right? Um, what's terrible about this, though? Paul. Yeah, so when I create the file, I'm like, that's, that's it, right? Like the inode has to store this array. The inodes potentially are a fixed size. So when I create the file, I've determined exactly how large the file is going to be, right? And, and probably, and, and again, this array doesn't scale very well. It potentially could be quite sparse, right? If I make, if I decide to support really large files, then I have this really ugly empty array sitting around uh, that I don't need for the small files, right? So this is, you know, this is kind of too bad. Um, so the data structure that, that a lot of file systems actually use is, um, is a multi-level index. It's similar in a certain way to multi-level page tables, but it's not quite the same, right? Um, the, the reason here, right, with multi-level page tables, we had this challenge of trying to design an efficient, a space efficient and lookup efficient data structure, given that address spaces are very big, right, and also sparse, okay? Files, we're not worried about sparsity, right? And the file size is flexible, right? So some files can get quite big, right? But other files we want to be quite small. And we want the, uh, the, the state that we have to store in order to support large files to scale nicely as the file gets big. But we also still don't want lookups to take forever, right? Like they did with the linked list. Um, so w the way that we do this is the following, right? So um, the inodes, inodes can store uh, several different types of pointer, right? And, and usually inodes are set up to, to store you know, various types of these, right? So inodes will have some references potentially to data blocks themselves, right? We call these direct blocks, right? So direct blocks are directly linked to the inode, right? So finding a direct block is a very easy process. I find the inode, and you know, the, the so the first bit of the file is stored in the direct blocks, right? As the file gets bigger, what I do is I start creating data blocks that are themselves full of pointers to other data blocks, right? So this is kind of a second level of, of my tree, and I call these indirect blocks, right? 
What do I do when the file gets even bigger? Sam. Yeah, I have pointers to blocks that contain pointers to blocks, right? And I call these doubly indirect blocks, right? And what happens if the file gets even bigger? You know, I can keep playing this game all day, right? I can create, actually some file systems have triply indirect blocks, right? Pointers to blocks and contain pointers to blocks and contain pointers to blocks, right? I think I got that right. Um, yeah, so, so here's, here's an example, right? So, and this is a, a pretty, pretty easy example, but you can imagine how this scales. So I have my inode, right? This, this inode, how many direct blocks does this inode have? Two, right? So there's two data blocks that are linked directly from the inode itself. And then how many indirect blocks does this inode have? It has one indirect block that, store, that is pointing to two. So this is the indirect block, right? This is the pointer. This is the block that takes pointers to other blocks, right? There are two extra data blocks that are linked off this indirect block, right? If I allocated another, let, let's say that my indirect blocks store four pointers to data blocks. If I allocated another data block for this file, where would its pointer go? Tau. So, so I'm going to add another data block, right? How am I going to store the pointer to that data block? Where is it going to go? Robert. I think that's actually Richard. I have four data blocks. I'm going to go to five, right? It's like the, this is like the razor thing, right? Like going to five blades. Um, nobody got that joke except for me. Uh, <laughs> so, so I, where where is the next block pointer going to go? Peng. Yeah, so I'm going to add it to this indirect block, right? Because this indirect block still has two more, two more um, data blocks that it can store, right? So I can allocate two more data blocks and associate them with this file before I have to potentially add a doubly indirect block or allocate another indirect block or something, right? So, so this is essentially how this works, right? As files get big, you know, the nice thing about it is, so, so the wasted quote unquote space, right, here, are any of these blocks that only store pointers to other data blocks, right? But you can imagine those, those pointer blocks grow slowly as the file size grows, right? And the nice thing is my lookup time is still quite fast, right? So essentially I have O1 for data blocks that are directly linked to the inode and ON for an indirect, like for an N indirect block, right? So for a, for a singly, for, so for an indirect block I have two lookups, right? I have to find this guy and then find the data block, right? Does this make sense to everybody? Any questions on this? Yeah, Alyssa. Okay, good. So yeah, so the inode, um, that's a good question, right? So the inode might have other metadata in it that's taking up space, right? So yeah, that, that's a great question. These guys, these guys can you probably usually store more block pointers than the inode can because they don't have any, this other information in it. Right? Like, I try to pack these things with pointers as much as possible. But it's a good question. Right? Any other questions about this example? Yeah, Suman. Uh, so they don't contain any data, like pointers, or can't we use them for some data and then? Yeah, you, yeah so you could, right? It's, it's a trade-off, right? So if you do that, right, so, so what Suman is asking is, can I put data in here, right? Yeah, you could. But if you do that, you're just eliminating the number of block pointers that you can store in there, right? Um, you know, so, so yeah, you, you, you could have uh, the blocks that were a mixture of, of, of data blocks and, and data themselves, right? I, I don't know. I mean, I think at this point almost every conceivable option in file systems has been tried, right? Um, so I'm guessing that somebody did that once, right? And, and some file systems might still do it. These are good questions. Any other questions? All right, so what's nice about this approach? Right, we've talked about it a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I can, I can potentially, it's, it's usually not infinite, right? There's usually some limit based on the inode structure, right? So, so a lot of file systems will have limits for, for example, like I can only have three triply indirect blocks, right? But I can still have like really, really big files, right? I'm not, there, there probably are file systems that, that don't have limits on the size of the file, but with modern file systems, those limits are like in the dozens of terabytes, right? So they're not, 
I don't know. They're, they're, <laughs> they're not, I mean, I, I say this now, right? Uh, yesterday I was joking with a, a colleague of mine because um, a, a lot of old, well, I shouldn't say this, a lot of current camcorders and, and cameras still use FAT32 as their file system, right? FAT32, I think, was probably invented in like the early 1980s, right? And FAT32 has this limitation that um, files can only, I think, get to be <laughs> two gigabytes, right? Uh, which I'm sure at the time they designed FAT32 felt like huge, right? It's like two gigabytes. Who would have a single file with two gigabytes? Well, now when you start taking HD video, right, what happens on these camcorders is they fill up two gigabytes. You know, sometimes it takes about half an hour, and then they just shut off, right? They're just like, well, you didn't want to record anymore, right? So I, and, and actually, when I bought this camcorder, one of the things I had to look for was a camcorder that allowed you to take longer videos in HD because a lot of them hit this FAT32 limit and they stop. So Oliver and I were laughing because we were saying, you know, how likely do you think it is that when people created FAT32, they were like, yeah, man, like 20 years from now, this is going to irritate people who buy these HD camcorder things that we haven't even thought of yet. So at, at some point, like the 128 terabyte file size limit with the XT4 or whatever it is may, may be important right, to somebody somewhere. Right? Um, and, and so we, sh we shouldn't laugh about it because it's possible. Right? I, don't, I can't imagine what they'd be doing that would store that much data. Um, what's that? Recording yeah, recording holograms. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, so anyway, if, if that's the future, that's very cool, right? I'm excited to be part of it. I'm just going to say this right now. I hope by 20 years from now we're recording holograms that take up 128 terabytes of space. Right? Uh, okay, so, so anyway, so there is, there is some limit, right? But we, we, hopefully we've pushed that limit out far enough where it won't bother us for like another 5, 10 years, right? Uh, other pros of this approach. What about lookup times? They're, they're pretty fast, right? Like, uh, the, so the index scales with the size of the file, which is what we want, and offset looks up, uh, lookups are pretty fast, right? And, and you could probably quantify this as probably like log n or something, but, but they, grow, they grow slowly, right? They don't grow linearly like they did with, um, with my linked list, but they're, they're not constant time like they were with the array, so this is another kind of artful compromise, right? Um, and also it allows us small files to stay pretty small, right? So potentially a file on ext4 would contain one inode and one data block, right? And a lot of directories probably do. In fact, if you, if you go back to our example with looking at the super block, right? Remember we had that one group that had run out of inodes but still had many data blocks. What, I mean, what's one reason that that could have happened? What, what's one type of file that we would not expect to take up much space that your system probably has lots and lots and lots of? Sean? Configuration. Well, configuration, maybe I'm thinking of something else, though. Directories, right? Maybe that group is full of directories, right? All those directories, tiny little files, you know, that, that directory data structure doesn't take up much space, probably one data block, one inode, and so it allocated a bunch of directories in that, dire in, in that particular group, and then, and then they're gone, right? And, and then I have a bunch of data blocks lying around that I didn't get to use, right? All right, so on Monday we're going to talk about uh, two things. We're going to talk about, first of all, caching, right? So we're going to say, how do I make file systems look fast? It's our favorite old trick where I'm going to use a small, fast thing to make a big, slow thing look faster. And then the second thing we're going to look at is consistency, both in terms of just the disk failures, but also clearly file system caching makes the consistency challenge a little bit more interesting. And we'll spend, I think, a lecture and a half talking about that because there's some nice approaches to it. So have a great weekend, and I will see you on Monday.